the first thing you need to know is that I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I managed to land a couple of shots in the dark and attract some insanely talented people uh, that I'm very fortunate to work with. So please take everything I say with the biggest grain of salt and please draw your own conclusions. All objects that move through a fluid are designed in three dimensions with a historical deviation from that being skis and snowboards. Now H2O solid is very similar to H2O liquid. And by treating snow like a fluid, we can design and build snowboards and skis that are fundamentally more advanced and more importantly, way more fun to ride. And so at Gilson, that's what we do. And now today we have multiple patents and we build for skiers and riders globally. This last year, we became the fastest growing snowboard company in the world. So over the last several years, uh, I mean, totally surreal, right? I'm finding myself in this spot, looking back over the last several years and sort of reflecting on this time, I've come to realize that there are two things that have been consistently very true. And the first is that success and innovation comes from really only two places. From either the lessons learned during repeated failure or from total accidents. And we've definitely had a few of both. The second thing is that our education system is training us to fear failure and to avoid it at all costs. But failure is the moment when we have the opportunity to learn the most. When something goes right, all you can do is say, don't touch that dial. And we do that occasionally. But when something goes wrong, you can figure out why. And so as painful as that moment is, we need to squeeze that failure for every last drop of insight. And so in 2011, I graduated Johns Hopkins University and moved down to Nashville, Tennessee. I grew up in Rhode Island, right? So this is a big move. And I found myself in front of a class of what I came to know as just the most amazing, amazing kids. But the ability levels were just this huge range, right? So one seat over here, we have a student who, mind you, I'm in fifth and sixth grade. My other science teacher is Austin Royer. He's teaching seventh and eighth. He's now my business partner. Life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. That's a story for another time. So in one student, we've got a student, uh, or in one seat, we've got a student who's reading on a third grade level instead of six. Next seat over, we've got a student who's right on target in the sixth grade. Next seat over, student reading on a 12th grade level somehow. Next seat over, a kid thinking about concepts on a college level. Next seat over, someone learning English for the first time. Next seat over, Abdul Basit asking me theoretical physics questions about objects entering black holes from different reference frames. To be fair, that kid might be a genius, someone to keep an eye on. Um, but so, so we're standing here, right? And I'm at the helm of a completely failing ship. And we are just driving into the ground. I mean, we're, it's been driving into the ground, but here I am now in control and somehow responsible for turning this thing around. And one of the first things that Austin and I noticed is that Despite all of these differences in ability level, there was a common thread that tied every single student together. And that was this crippling fear of failure, particularly tied to this thing called the TCAP test. <laughs> and I'm sure everybody in here has taken numerous standardized tests and been judged on how well you can answer questions when four potential answer choices are already given to you. Uh, but this thing was just awful. And the administrators and the other people in the school system knew that this test would determine not only these kids' futures, but the future of the school, the future of the teachers, the future of everyone. And there was so much pressure put on this test, this stupid test, that it just was debilitating. I mean, you know what it's like to fear failure. You freeze. You can't do what you need to do. And this test of multiple choice questions that happens only once a year is somehow something that we're supposed to be teaching to for nine months, or however long the school year is, something I should probably know as a former teacher. Uh, and so, and so these, these, these kids would have, w w wouldn't be able to perform, right? And we saw teachers unable to perform too, putting all of this emphasis on this one single test at the end of the year that really assess skills that I am going to argue don't matter. And so the first thing that we needed to do was break down this fear of failure and we did that through two things. We did that through unity, this idea that all of the kids in the class, we're all on the same team here. We're not fighting against each other for who can do best. If one of us fails, we all fail. This is a team effort. 
And secondly, and so that got kids behind teaching kids ahead and kids ahead teaching kids behind, everybody reinforcing concepts. But more importantly, the second thing that we did is that we made a proclamation that this test is stupid and we're not gonna teach to this test. We're gonna teach so far beyond the test. We're gonna teach the skills and mindsets needed to figure out the answer instead of just regurgitate it from memory. And in so doing, this test would then appear to be easy, even if you had never seen the material before. And then this, and, and the way that we did this is we brought in projects, firstly day to day, and when I say we, I mean Austin and I, the other science teacher in his classes and mine respectively, different rooms. The, the, so we brought in these projects that were day-to-day -day projects and then week-to-week -week and then month-to-month -month, and then ultimately we realized that on top of these projects, we could have each kid be working on their own curiosity project for a year. Something that they could be anything, just something that they were hugely interested in, right? And so when I was their age, I had been thinking about this concept of why are three-dimensional snowboard or why are skis and snowboards flat when every other object that moves through a fluid is curved. Boats, cars, planes, they're all curved to enhance some performance benefit. Skis and snowboards have remained flat. So when I was my student's age, I built this when I was 14 between two doors. <laughs> it was the first, you know, I'm biased, I can tell you it worked. I'm the only one who wrote it and we can leave it at that, but honestly it didn't, it was a bit of a failure. <laughs> uh, but I brought this in to my students as a young teacher and I said, this is what I was thinking about when I was your age. This is what I would think about during the school day so that I could go home and build it after school. This is what really got me going. And each student then started their own project with something that they were personally interested in. And in an act of solidarity, Austin and I revisited this snowboard concept. We got a little carried away, to say the least. <laughs> we, I, had a, I had a house in, in Nashville, Tennessee. I would rented one floor of the house with my roommates, not the crawl space in the basement, but we drilled out that crawl space and we started to build a rudimentary snowboard shop. We were teaching and working on lesson plans, et cetera, north of 100 hours a week. And in the time, the free time beyond that, we were revisiting this snowboard concept and it really became all encompassing. And the students got really involved. Over the course of several months, we built two prototypes, two boards, several months. Fortunately, our <laughs> rates are a little bit better than that these days. But it took two months to build the first two prototypes. And in that Christmas break, we took these boards out to Colorado. Not with the students, obviously. And I was expecting the moon. The kids were expecting the moon. Austin is a very rational person. He was moderating expectations. <laughs> uh, and, and he was right. We rode these boards, and Austin described them as like trying to ride a canoe down the mountain. I mean, it was like an awful failure, and I was devastated. And incredibly stubbornly, I rode these things for four days. And because we're total nerds, we had designed all of these, and also teachers, we had designed all these studies to then show our kids what great success looks like, right? <laughs> Instead, we ended up collecting a whole lot of data on what rock bottom failure looks like. <laughs> and so we brought the boards and, and we brought the data back to the classroom. And I remember standing there in early, in early January and sort of with my tail between my legs, telling the students, has, this did not go as planned, not at all. <laughs> so we're going through these very detailed studies, right? We've, got, we've sent boards down the slope and you know, timers and all the rest of it. Basically middle school science on the mountain. And, <laughs> and I, I told them, you, know, you guys are still responsible for your projects, but I'm calling it quits. Because <laughs> I've already invested way too much time and money and there's no way, I can't keep doing this. And I'll never forget this moment. One of my students, Cassius, raises his hand, only kid in the room to raise his hand. Everyone else is just, cannot believe that they're hearing this, right? That we're gonna quit and they're still responsible. Cassius raises his hand and he looks me right in the eyes and he says, Mr. Gilson, if you can quit, we can quit. Nobody will humble you faster than a fifth grader. <laughs> Actually, that's Cassius right there. That is Abdul Basid and that's Michael in the background. This is a woodshop class that we taught later that year. So, what, I mean, what could I do, right? Back to the drawing boards. I was floored, I was speechless, I had nothing to say. There's no way to get out of that one. So we went back to the drawing boards and the interesting thing that happened here is we then systematically journaled all of the failings of the original prototypes. 
We figured out what went wrong and why, and we did this with the students. And then we came up with four potential solutions to each one of these problems, showing this iterative process of failure in engineering. And so we inadvertently showed them what rock bottom failure looks like. And now we're gonna show them what it looks like to climb back out of it. And the interesting thing that happened is that we invented something called the soft edge, which now, if you ask anybody about the brand, the first thing that they will tell you about is the soft edge. The design that made this successful, right? There's a lot more that goes into building a company than just the technology and design. Arguably, that's less than 1%. But the design component that has made us successful is the soft edge. And the soft edge is a reactionary design to a total failure. That spring, we took our revamped prototypes back out to Colorado. In the meantime, we had blown up one press <laughs> and we're no longer even capable of making snowboards. And we had managed to somehow get out these three new prototypes, testing different variations of the soft edge, which is basically just a bend in the base layer of material to lift your steel up off the snow, and it's what unlocked the potential for three-dimensional design. Because you really can't take advantage of a three-dimensional shape if you're always on one edge or always on the other. You need to have the ability to ride flat, and the soft edge is what opened those doors. And so we took the new prototypes out to uh, Colorado that spring, over spring break, and totally different experience. From a qualitative standpoint, they were a blast. From a quantitative standpoint, they were accelerating 26% faster than a standard snowboard. Turns out nobody cares. <laughs> you can already go uncomfortably fast on skis and snowboards. But what we had proved is that by changing the shape, by designing in three dimensions instead of just calling it flat, we could fundamentally change the performance characteristics of skis and snowboards, which is what gave us the motivation to build this company. That spring, we had this hugely emotionally charged conversation with the students, and we had gotten very close at this point over a couple of years, and they said, you know what? This is our last year anyway with you as a teacher. You need to go do this. You need to take this to fruition. And so they really did give me that big kick in the butt to actually go full time and do this. We then moved with our initial team to central Pennsylvania to a cabin in the woods with no running water and electricity. And we were hiking out each day to a donkey stable. We were building snowboards, minimum viable products, I should say, uh, with, with processes stacked on top of each other in a donkey stable. We had a CNC, by far the most expensive thing I had ever owned in my life at that stage. You know, CNC robot, right? Accurate to two thousandths of an inch accuracy in a donkey stable with a donkey next to it. I mean, an active donkey stable. <laughs> we had processes stacked up on top of each other. One of the most important things when you're doing high pressure lamination is cleanliness. And let me remind you, we're in a donkey stable. <laughs> and, so, and so here we are. That, that summer, we managed to produce 30 or 40 minimum viable products. They looked like garbage. They were falling apart, but they were snowboards. We took them on the road. We traveled 17,000 miles in a truck with 200,000 miles on it and an Airstream trailer from 1976. And we collected a lot of data. And it was a nationwide party. But we also learned a lot. <laughs> we went as far east as Maine, as far west as California. And we basically let people try these things totally for free. Just give us your feedback. Th we, we had enough encouragement coming back from that trip to fully move forward. But what we didn't understand is that while riders themselves were adopting this quickly, falling in love and said, I've never felt anything like that before, and not only does it feel fundamentally different, but it also feels fundamentally better. But we would hit our first major business failure that spring. We moved into, a, into the shop now, right? When you've got a team of people around one North Star, one vision, right? One of the really important things is to show constant improvements to the quality of life. And it's way easier if you start with the bar really low. <laughs> and so when we moved into the shop, we now had all the finer things like running water and electricity and heat. And but, we, but if you look at our inventory shelves, they look a lot like bunk beds because they were. Uh, and so we, we then hit our first major business failure. We, failure. we got rejected by over 3,000 retailers over the next 18 months. Full out rejected. And they didn't really say the nicest things when they rejected us either. Not all of them. I still remember most of them. Um, and, so, and so after 18 months of refining and trying to figure out how we're going to do this, we ultimately 
uh, it was really the first business-wide sort of memorandum that I put out, which was that no one is to spend a second of their time or a penny of money pursuing a retail relationship unless they contact us first. And the interesting thing that happened is we then took a group of insanely talented people and put them on figuring out how to deliver skis and snowboards to end users directly. And fast forwarding, this has now allowed us, with the power of the internet and FedEx, right, it's a changing world out there, it's allowed us to invest in way higher quality raw materials, better build practices, we do it on American soil paying American wages, and most importantly, we develop really meaningful long-term relationships within our community, not with other businesses, with other businesses, distributors, retailers, wholesalers, that then talk to our actual community. And none of this would have happened without a very painful series of failures and all of the learning associated. So what can these experiences tell us about the future and our education system? Well, the jobs of the future are changing. And many of our schools are not yet adapting to teach the new skills needed. Creativity, innovative thinking, and social intelligence are becoming the only things in demand for human labor, and not repetitive tasks that can be measured on a grade A through F scale. Multiple choice questions and the ability to just regurgitate information that is arguably useless, if not definitely useless, is being made irrelevant in this age of look it up. So we as people need to adapt faster than ever before, and our schools need to be leading the movement. In the time that we have taken flight, put man on the moon, and then globally connected billions of people worldwide with these little devices in our pocket, we have continued to teach with pencil and paper. And we're teaching skills that are now antiquated. If we do not redirect, we will train the next generations to be 20th century factory workers in a world where the pace of change is accelerating. Now, at the beginning, I mentioned that I have no idea what I'm talking about. And I maintain that this is very much true. But nobody does when exploring uncharted waters. And that is why failure is the most important tool we have. It is how we explore new territory. Our students grew from 18% proficiency to 89% proficiency. Our school went from being unranked to having our program be in the top four in the district. And together with our students, we built the foundation for this company out of the classroom. We did this by shifting our mindsets around failure. So, we must not teach our students to be afraid of failure and avoid it as a means to success. Because successful people and successful organizations are not the ones that manage to navigate around all failure and obstacle, they're the ones that responded to it well. Instead, we must teach our students, and ourselves for that matter, how to learn from failure, how to productively process the associated emotions, and then how to use it all for growth. And so with this, I encourage you to fail quickly, fail cheaply, and then get creative.